to AWARE. We are dedicated to communicating information that inspires your positive growth and change. Are you interested in a peaceful planet? Are you interested in optimal health? Are you living with purpose? Are you enjoying your life? We realize each person can make a difference, and our mission is to empower your awareness. The choices that you make in every moment shape your life, and we encourage you to realize that you have your own answers and to always listen to your own truth. We invite you to stay aware. Hi, I am Lisa Gar, and welcome to The Aware Show. I am so grateful that you are here today. Some of the dangers of systemic racism have really caused people to ask, you know, what can I do to make a difference? And that's the right conversation to be in. However, it is not a one-step process. It is not a one-day, one-parade process. This is a conversation that has ignited a daily process of change. And it's time. It's time, which is why we are having this conversation. And we have in this incredible series with my incredible guest, Lisa Nichols. And so what we're talking about today is one of the systemic problems is the school to prison pipeline and prison reform. Now, in order to change an entire system, we need to become aware of the system. And understanding and interrupting this system is how we become aware of it and start to create change. Lisa is that change leader. She's a change leader. She's a catalyst. She's a transformational leader. She's in a beautiful, amazing soul. And she has been uh, the catalyst of transformation for over 30 years no, 30 years, I think. 30 years, Lisa? <laughs> I feel like it. It's, it's like 25, but I feel like it. <laughs> 25 years, 30 years, 30 million people. That's, that's what I was just thinking in my mind, but so right, much right, more. Right. It's growing every day. <laughs> and it's growing so much more. We we were just talking, Lisa, about, you know, you had really been teaching an enormous amount and you were really looking to settle into your teachings a little bit and let them carry on themselves with motivating the masses and speak and write to make millions and all that you have spent your life's work on. And you were trying to just settle in and then the world opened back up again and your voice is needed more than ever now, which is a calling that you're answering because of the transformational nature of who you are. But how are you feeling today, these days, and how is your calling changing? Well, um, I feel inspired uh, on on many days. Uh, there are days when I feel frustrated. Uh, I feel encouraged. I feel encouraged more than anything. If you ask what's the dominating feeling, I feel encouraged. But this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is one of those things when um, I, I ran track for, uh, for many years and my coach would say, Lisa, this is a long race. Pace yourself. And so I, I would say that. So I, I feel encouraged more than anything else. But I do feel I still touch all of those other emotions. Um, and that's real. And I think that we should give ourselves permission to touch every emotion. Just don't stop and take out real estate in any emotion that doesn't serve a forward moving conversation. And so, um, you know, I'm doing a lot of educating, a lot of engaging, a lot of facilitating courageous conversations um, between our black brothers and sisters and our white brothers and sisters so that we can um, find that place where we meet. You know, when you have two people that care but they don't know how to navigate the relationship, um, that's when you may have a coach come in or may have someone who can come in and facilitate that. And I, I, I'm grateful that I've been asked to do that in several environments. Can you help facilitate conversation? Uh, so that's where yes. I've been spending a lot yes. of energy. It's It's been an incredible education specifically for that conversation around white privilege. And every single day there are behaviors that white people were not aware of that they, in order to take responsibility, first need to become aware of and yeah. own. And, and it's been completely unconscious 
and yet at the same time, I'm so grateful for the, for the, just the, the wake up and the awareness and the, even conversations I was having that I thought was, was great. I, I am well, so that, willing and open. And that, can be, that can be so disruptive to you and painful. It's great. And, 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 you know, and, and not everyone's receiving it with, this is great. Like that's wonderful mm. because of the type of person you are. But if you look at the, the nature of having something that was in your blind spot now made aware to you and you're like, oh my God, that's been there all the time. How did I not know that? Yeah. You know, and then yeah. to see it attached to such emotion, the hurt and the anger and the shame, oh. to me, genuinely good people, white, black, Asian, Latina, people of color, genuinely good people don't want to hurt people, right? Right. And so when right. you see your brothers and your sisters, you know, uh, of another nationality or of the same, when you see them hurt and you go, how did I not see this? So I want to just be mindful of the pain, a different kind of pain, a different kind of discomfort, a different kind of, 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 of angst that some of our white brothers and sisters are going through because they are um, compassionate, empathetic, they're feeling, and so they feel it. Um, I want to acknowledge that because that's real. What we have a tendency to think, Lisa, is that if we acknowledge one person's pain, it discounts ours. If we acknowledge one person's compassion, it means we're not. And so I just want to, I want to first put, just put a, a stake in the ground to say, let's stop comparing hurt. Let's stop comparing okay. discomfort. You can't have the discomfort that a black woman has. Not possible. I can't have the discomfort that a white woman would have right now that really cares. I don't know what that feels like. And I, I see the conversations occurring without the regard that I don't know what you feel like. And can we be okay to, to agree to have two totally different experiences without it discounting the other persons? Yes. And I am so grateful for your gentleness because I am embarrassed to even ask some of these questions. I know. For I know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I wrote a book called Becoming Aware, and I'm not aware of the difference in a lot of the, the conversations that I, I feel uncomfortable with. And even talking about prison reform, I don't have the experience that, say, for example, you have with prison reform, and I don't know if I'm asking the right questions. So all I will right. do is... I want to listen, I want to learn, I want to hear, and I want to act. So I appreciate that. And um, it's like this. It's like we're in a family, right? We're in a family called the human family. And there's been an experience happening to a part of the family that it's been there. It hasn't been, um, it hasn't been invisible. It's been there. Um, it's been happening. Uh, it, it, it's it's required people to yell and say, "Hey, stop! This isn't right." But then there's this other part of the the house that the entire family is in, and this experience that part of the family is having doesn't quite make its way to the living room. It doesn't make its way to the dining room table. It's not allowed there. And all of a sudden, now the experience that part of the family is having is on the dining room table. And you can't even sit down for dinner without this experience being right in front of our face. And so half the family is saying, how long has this been happening? And the other half said, we've been trying to tell you it's been happening way back then. That's where you see all the anger and all of the rage and all of the hurt to go, this has been in our house. It's been in our house so long. Here's the opportunity. So many times people are asking black people now, about the experience. I want to say to my white sisters and brothers who care about ending any form of racism, who care about social justice, I am grateful for you. We cannot do this without you. What I'm going to ask you to do is to find out what are you curious about? 
and then go get the document, the documentaries, go get the books, go get the news flash, go get the things that can help you educate and go and educate yourself. And then when you come and we talk, come with some of that. So you at least have an idea of the question you want to ask. There's so much content out. I was just talking to a, a African-American executive today who works at a Fortune 500 company. And she said, what do you say, Lisa? How do you coach the African-American leaders in corporate America who are exhausted about having the conversation because when their white superiors are asked to lead a conversation about social justice and cultural sensitivity, the white leaders are coming to the African-American middle managers saying, can you lead this conversation? Well, while we're happy to do that, what I wanna invite you to do is also go do research. Go do research, find the documentaries. I sat this weekend, I looked at documentaries on Metro Evers, and I looked at documentaries on Shirley Chisholm and Ida B. Wells. I looked at documentaries on Maya Angelou and, and, um, and Angela Davis and, and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I looked at their juxtaposed position. I looked at the things that Malcolm X said about Martin Luther King. I looked at some of the things that were written about them both. I looked at the Nelson Mandela journey, even though he's from South Africa. How did that pair? I was educating myself so that I can fully understand it. And, and to not live in it, to not backstroke in it, but to be aware enough to go, I get it. Now, I, I'm writing a piece of poetry that I, I told you about before, I'm taking my time with it. And I said, it, to share with people what's happening now, when you see someone who's African-American angry or frustrated and you see all it coming out, it hurts my heart, to see it so much every day. If you ask someone, if, if one of my white sisters or brothers said, where is that coming from? Why is it so intense? Then I'll tell you this, because I've been really studying this, Lisa. You see the anger and you see the hurt coming from the exhaustion, mm. like the exhaustion of the longevity of the same conversation. And so it's like, I cry my grandmother's tears and I feel my grandfather's angst. And one of the things that makes in choose peace so powerful uh, and other um, uh, likened conversation is that you bring us to a place of completeness when you say, I understand this, I understand this, I get this, I get this, and I understand this, that I understand. Now, yes. How do we move forward from here? When you do that, and that does require you to take yourself out of your shoes and put yourself in my shoes through learning and through awareness yes. and through study. You are understudied. You're understudied. And yes. we're over-experienced. And we're over-experienced. Yes. And so we yes. want to bring that chasm together a little bit by your studying, and then we kind of end the experiences. Yes, yes. There's a great piece uh, by this woman, Layla Syed, and she wrote Me and White Supremacy. And she talks about, it's, it was originally a 28-day uh, challenge on Instagram talking about how to educate white people. Now, she's in a, 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 about 15 different nationalities and how to educate white people about the conversation between about white supremacy and white privilege and really helped identify and call out. And I highly suggest that it's being turned into a book right now. And in this, for this particular show, there was a woman that I spoke with, her name is Shakti Butler, and she did a whole film called Healing Justice about the school to prison pipeline and about mm -hmm. prison reform and about what is happening around prison reform. Now, there statistically, it's a it's a horrible statistic that the percentage of men in prison who were originally in juvenile detention facilities is about sixty six percent. So you look at that, and you look at kids who kids who were in the in these juvenile detention facilities, and their recidivism rate is so high because they don't have any other source of, of, of uh, support. And so getting the support within the school, the, within the schools and within the juvenile detention facilities is the first place. 
But in your situation, Lisa, you have a unique experience and I'd love you to share it with us because I would like to find if there's anything that we can do to create real systems change as a result of this conversation, real solutions as a result of this conversation. I don't know where this is going and I'm very open and very, I'm absolutely fine with admitting that. So I would love to find out if there's something that we can create okay. out of this conversation that could motivate change. Yes. So um, my, I met my son's father um, while I was working. Uh, I had a, um, I had my computer was uh, broken and he was um, a computer technician. Um, and the, as a side job and his main job was he was an educator at a private um, school in Los Angeles. And um, he immediately began volunteering at my facility. Um, we entered into a relationship, had an amazing relationship. Uh, over a little over a year later, I ended up pregnant with my son, Jelani. Um, and um, I remember he coming from South Central, coming from the community, I would hear things he did when he was younger. And, and I was very clear. I said, I don't do anything that's against the law. I don't do anything. And, and he was very committed and very charged. And, and um, when my son was born and my son was eight months old, I got a phone call from him. And he said, Lisa, I'm in LA County Jail. And I remember my heart sank because I avoided dating <laughs> when I was in um, middle school and high school uh, in particular neighborhoods because I was so afraid that I would uh, potentially, like my friends, end up pregnant and, and my son's father would go to jail because that happens so often in our communities. It's you're afraid to be pulled over for a, a busted taillight because that could be devastating. And so my, I, I did everything I could. I was a track athlete. I stayed in the books. I stayed in track uh, and I didn't look up and I didn't deal with boys because I was afraid of one thing, one thing only. And that was being with someone who had the chance of going to prison. So when I was got when I was pregnant with my son, I was 27, 28. Um, I felt like I had passed that time. So when my son's father, when he was eight months, called me and said, "Lisa, I'm in prison," I was devastated. I was floored. My son's father is brilliant. He was a elementary school teacher. Um, within five years of being in prison, um, he had authored his first three books. Um, wow. Within 10 years of being in prison, he had authored yet another seven books and was at 10. My son turns 26 this year. And mm. because of the three strikes law, which two of the strikes he did as a minor, um, my son's father is still in prison 20 five, 26 years later. And mm. he now wow. has authored in excess of 16 books. Wow. Um, Phenomenal. And, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, just, just, yeah, just a, I can't even put words to it. Just um, horrific. Horrific is, it got it. It's, well, it's the dismantling I, 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 of the black family. It's the dis, the systemic dismantling of the black family, and I know that's hard to hear. Um, it's only hard to hear for people who have morals and values and mm. and mm. conscious and care, um, because you just didn't know what was going on in the background. It was in the other room of the house, right? It's in the right. other room of right. the house, and um, it's the systemic dismantling of the black family. Um, uh, happened in different ways um, earlier in, but but the juvenile ju the justice system um, it was designed to take the most um, threatening person out of the equation, and that was the black man. 
And so that's what you see. I'm not saying, and please, please make sure you hear me correctly. I'm not saying that he did not deserve to pay for whatever crime that had him go to jail in the first place. I will say that the crime needs to match the punishment and the punishment needs to match the crime. And for so many um, formerly young black men, no longer young, that the first and, and correct, I could be incorrect on this, but I doubt it because I remember this, the first kid that was sentenced under the three strikes law, he had two strikes as a juvenile and his first strike as an adult, he stole a, stole a slice of pizza in Santa Monica and got 62 years. That is absolutely insane. That's, that's got to be, that's got to be fought. And have, have you ever, or am, am I being naive completely here in asking, has that ever been approached in order to appeal anything? Is absolutely. there? Absolutely, absolutely. But I want you to think about it as um, five years ago or eight years ago, remember when people were saying Black Lives Matter? Mm. And they were, okay. they were pigeonholed as the violent or the militant ones, remember that? You I, can, I see what you're saying. Before. You see what I'm saying? So Black Lives Matter isn't new. The campaign, Black Lives Matter, the 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 football player who took his knee at the game, he wasn't he wasn't taking his knee to disrespect America the way he was painted. He took his knee for social justice. Now, after being out of football for the last two years, now the NFL wants to bring him back in because it's the right thing to do. Well, if it's the right, right. thing to do now. Why was he painted as such an anti-American back then? So yes, things have been done, just like Black Lives Matter was back five, six years ago. It's just that no one saw it again, happening to the family in the house, in the other room. And then we wonder why are people angry? Because how did, what happened now that now made it okay for it to no longer be okay where we could have saved a few hundred people back yes. then. So I'm, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not putting fire on the anger. I'm just saying if we can have more compassion for it, then we can help diffuse it so we can move on. And so the short, long answer is, yeah, people have been fighting against reform. People have been um, campaigns, organizations, um, uh, fighting against the three uh, strikes. The movies, like it's been mm -hmm. so much. Let me just tell you when change will come. And, and I, I'm, I'm going to be quite honest with you, Lisa. It doesn't make me happy to say this. Because coming, at, coming um, from an African-American perspective, the constant conversation is, I matter. I matter. Right? That, that, yes. that's, that's what we're saying, right? And in this case, yes. Black Lives Matter, which, by the way, when you hear someone say Black Lives Matter, don't make it mean your life doesn't. Right. Yeah. That's where yeah, the no. argument comes into play. And it's incorrect. Bl saying Black Lives Matter does not mean Asian life doesn't, Indian life doesn't, Latino life doesn't, white life doesn't. It simply means, can you acknowledge and treat me? as if my life matters. So I just want to say that. Um, and then um, understanding that, and I, I said, I, I, it, it, I don't want to say this because it hurts to have to say this, that as an African-American, I would love to be able to influence change on uh, for my culture by myself. I'd love to have you with me. And if you're not, I'd still love to be able to do it, right? So it's a very sobering, frustrating experience, but it's true to know that social justice reform, systemic change, and anti-racism moving forward can only happen when our white brothers and sisters join the charge. It can only happen then because you're sitting at dinner with the person who, who governs that bill. You're, you're, you're going to a family reunion with the person who, who can actually make change in the system. As hard as it is for me to say as a black woman, 
And I'm not saying I don't want your help. I'm saying it hurts that I can't get it done on my own. I can't get it done. Mm. I, I, I have to, I have to mm. reach across the space and go, help me, help me with the thing that in many cases, your nationality has been the hands to produce the harm with. Right, I'm right, just, I'm right. To be honest with you, and that's why yeah. some people they don't have the conscious listening or the compassion or the capacity to get there yet. It, it's it, we want people to get there because it's been two months. No, it hasn't been two months. It's been four hundred years. It's been my right. mother and my grandmother. My grandmother is ninety-one, Lisa. My grandmother said, mm. "Baby, I feel bad. I thought that." I thought that you would have had it different than me, but I guess it's still, still the same. And so when you have mm -hmm. that, um, we, we then have to create the path that allows mm -hmm. us to, to understand. And so um, I'm a little bit of everywhere. Um, as you can see, I'm passionate about it. I hope that I, it's making sense. Yes, absolutely, it's making sense. And so for an educated man, who is brilliant and published and brilliant. making making a difference. I mean, how, so these measures that have been passed, like Measure R, and it was actually in Santa Monica that this was passed for police reform, even though it was passed in March, it, it, it hasn't come, I mean, March was not that long ago. So there's a lot, in a, a long way that we have to go, but it actually, it's a plan designed to reduce the jail population and incarceration and granting um, the sheriff and there's a whole civilian oversight committee, um, the power to investigate complaints. So maybe there is a way and because of this new measure and reform that is happening now and in this moment that yes, yes. we can all, Yes. take this yes. opportunity to actually make change happen. Yes. So, so I, 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 I want to, what am I not seeing? Correctly. Tell me what I'm not seeing. I, well, the one, the, the oversight council needs to look like the community. So there's yes. so many oversight councils that don't reflect who they're overseeing. Right. Uh, or yeah. they don't, like the, they don't reflect the end experience, the end user, the end person having the experience. And so the oversight committee needs to be the committee of the people, like the jury, right? The other thing is um, when you look at, um, particularly in the prison system, what people have been given 20, 30, and 40, and 50 years for. Like that's, that, that there needs to be a reform for the measure of the crime. When, if someone uh, took a purse and they were given 58 years, like that's just the truth. They took a mm -hmm. purse and they're given 58 years. I'm saying they mm -hmm. need to pay time. They need mm -hmm. to pay for their crimes. I am by no means partnering anyone's crime. I wanna be very clear on that. But the crime and the, and and this that particular reform that particular law was put in place because so many African American young men who turned eighteen already had two strikes. So the, the two strikes, mm -hmm. it, the two strikes mm -hmm. isn't even two three strikes as an adult. It's, adult. It's if you were ding dong at 14 and you know, you whatever, you ran out the store with some candy, whatever it is. I don't want to minimize it either. But so you're combining the adolescent choices. Think about if you're looking at this show right now, I know my son, my son is a gentle spirit. He's never been in any trouble. But man, if I looked at his adolescent decisions, <laughs> You know, and, right. and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying he didn't do something that, that could have gotten him in trouble. I'm saying no one knows about it. I'm not sure if he did. But if he did it at 15, you kind of understand because he's 15. He's 17. Right. And so how can that carry to your adult with such a harsh sentence? 
I'm not oh saying my don't God. Think, yeah. I don't know. I honestly don't understand it. And that's the whole point is that, yes, we got to get responsible and, and really do something about it because this type of movement now is getting heard more than ever. And plus, look, when you're a, a teenager and if you're an African-American teenager and you steal candy, and if you're a white teenager and you steal candy, the African-American teenager has a much higher percentage of getting busted for it. So that's a t complete disadvantage in the first place. So, I mean, you addressed it. The systemic dismantling of the African-American family started 400 years ago. It has continued on through this type of imbalance, this type of injustice. It's not a justice system whatsoever. It doesn't bring and justice so to anything. We, right. And Reform this is well. we to How do we how do we modify this? And not everything will happen tomorrow, but how do right. we begin to turn around? As a family, as a yes. human yes. race family, to go, you hold my hand. Put your hand up, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to put it right there. You hold, yes. Yeah. Hold it in a little more. Go in a little. You hold my hand, and yeah. I hold your hand. Mm -hmm. And together, we clamp hard and hold on to each other. Mm -hmm. And we say, how do we make our family better? Mm -hmm. Inside the family, mm -hmm. inside the family, there are different rooms. There's the room of white. There's a room of Christian. There's a room of uh, Buddhist. There's a room of black. There's a room of Latina. There's a room of Catholic. But we all go to the living room as family. Yes. And yes. how we move yes. forward is we say, tell me, and this is from you. This is from you and our white brothers and sisters. Tell me what I need to hear that I probably don't want to know about. Not mm. because you don't care, but because it's painful to hear. Because it's so unfair. So if you are willing to hear what doesn't feel good to hear so that you can do with us what's necessary to do, then we're okay. And so this is the time when we go, okay, as it, as we need to make a long list. So let's just go, I'll say again, this is a marathon. We need to make a long list. First was the eight that can't wait, right? The eight things inside law enforcement that have to be eliminated immediately, right? And you already saw that several of those things were already done. Right. So the eight that, that can't wait, that's the million letter campaign that's underway. Yes. You can go to the million letter campaign dot com and see that that's eliminating the dangerous acts being approved by the uh, various departments. OK, great. That's number one. Then on the next list. Uh, so there's going to be a list and the list might be 25 things long and the list yes. may span through our children turning 30 and 40. But the uh, beauty of right now, Lisa, the beauty is that now we're developing one list in one house. Ah, uh, yes, yes. It's not 28 different lists and 28 different organizations. Yes, yes, that is the beauty of this. And even with a measure like that, that Lisa was saying earlier, that measure R, has passed, it has been voted on, it is in effect now, now it's time to do our own research and find out yeah. what else can we do now that it has been passed. We're, we're over that hurdle. Um, is there anything, Lisa, that no, we no, can do? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got excited. I was gonna say, wait, just because it's passed does not right. mean it's enforced, right? And so- right. That, That's um, right. Exactly. So you're going to step into what can we do, right? <laughs> so yes. Name the name the bill. N n name it again. It's, it's R. Measure name R. Name the title, so people can know uh, what it is and what's the title of it. Measure R. It was in uh, passed in Santa Monica. There was an article done on Whole Life Times about it. Uh, the experts who wrote it. They. Um, it's only here in Los Angeles. And it's all of Los Angeles, which is a start. You know, it's a start. So what happens in LA and California tends to start to trend. Um, and that is what I know about it so far. Um, what I was going to ask what the is... Restate, restate what the measure is for, too, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something to that. But I want, you, I want people to hear okay. what measure R represents. 
Okay, so it's authorizing the Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission to develop a plan designed to reduce jail population and incarceration and granting the commission subpoena power to investigate complaints. Right. So granting the commission subpoena power to investigate complaints. So can we create a complaint? Can we create a complaint that we can, uh, that we can get to this commission about your son's father? Well, the first thing to do is to, um, because I, I, I'm not in it just for while, while I would love uh, this brilliant man to, ha to, to, he should have been out a long time ago. Um, yeah. While yeah. that, I, I want to, I want to make sure that I keep it um, uh, widespread for someone else's son's father yes. as well. And, you know, and, 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 and I, yes. I thank you for yes. that offer. And, and, and I've been waiting 26 years to see if this man can author over 17 books and be the leader that he has been inside um, this institution. Who can he be out? Um, I, I also want to speak for every person who has gone in. I, I think our letters should be in twofold. I, I, and it, they should request two things. Number one, that the oversight committee be a committee that, look, that reflects the people that they're protecting. So the over uh, uh, the people that they're speaking on behalf of. So there's some diversity. Let me just be real, real clear. There needs to be some diversity and not one token, not just one black token on the committee to say we have diversity, but it should look like if it's, if, 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 if the, the in Los Angeles, if it's 78% African-American, then the oversight committee should be 78% African-American. If it's 78% of color, then it should be 70, just fair. Just, uh -huh. it looks like, it looks like the people that are speaking for it. That's number one. So we should request that. And number okay. two, we should form the complaint that everyone there under the three strikes law, everyone, they're under the three strikes law for nonviolent crimes. Okay. That their case okay. be challenged for release. Now, okay. the majority of them are now over 50. They're uh, definitely over 45. Wow. So they're known now to cost the prisons more because they're uh. needing medicine, because they're needing, you know, that they have ailments. And so the drain on our, our, our political, our, our prison system's finance is even greater because we have so many people back in the, the uh, late 90s back in the early 2000s, charged with non-violent three strikes you're out crimes, and they've been in there forever. About eight years ago, I don't know the exact, uh, the exact length of time, but about eight years ago, um, they began to challenge uh, the reform, the whole three strikes you're out law, and they deemed that it was unfair. And they began to, they began to release okay. some people, but then it slowed down, and so really calling for the three strikes uh, law to literally be analyzed every single person. So to me, letter campaigns are powerful. Call campaigns are powerful, but calls disappear. Letters don't. And I know letters are, are, are old school and they almost feel like they're new to us because we haven't done it in a while. But really as a community going, hold on. If a young man at 19, 19 years old, made a mistake, he should not get 50 years right. um, yes. for a nonviolent yes. crime where he was like he does not seem to pose a threat to society. And so um, I, I, I would I would highly recommend um, I would recommend that. And um, and and while I, I want the personal attention to my son's father, I want every man that's lost their freedom. Um, and a portion of it they gave up based on their choice, but another portion they gave up because they were black. I like them to have a chance. That is absolutely true. That is a hundred percent true. Yes, a portion was their choice, and a portion, the majority of it, is because of the color of their skin. Yes. And so, in this, in this, as an example, is how 
reform is starting to change. It's now the time to have this conversation, just like you were talking about. Three years ago, it was just a conversation. Now it's an active, active movement. And anything other than movement is unacceptable. And that's what we're in. The, the conversation now has changed. In my opinion, it has changed. And it's not going away. So we can do something about the three strikes law as juveniles that we can actually make a difference in change. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at is how we can, and especially for the nonviolent cr crimes, how we can make that difference. And I'm going to find information out about this. Yeah, that, that was what I was going to yes. say. Our first thing, the first thing for us is to do our research because yes. um, the three strikes, the three strikes law was challenged, um, but the implementation and the enforcement of it—that's where, uh, and that may be more at a local level versus a national level or versus a statewide level. To go, how do we impact? And who's the decision maker to decide, okay, is that the warden? Is that the commissioner? Is that the, like, who is that that has that local influence? I know that very few people have challenged it. It's almost like when something happens to an African, African American man and he goes away, we just kind of go, oh, there's his life. Like it's, 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 um, so finding out what does that look like and what's that step and then putting that on our list. You yes. know that this list, this list is going to cross a multitude of platforms. This list is going to cross real estate. This list cross the educational system and the resources, academia. Yes. This, this yes. list cross social services. This list, like if we look at this, is our children will will grow into this. That inherit this. Yes. To to start. Yeah, they're going to inherit it, but they they should not inherit it where we found it. As your grandmother said, yes, as your yeah. grandmother said, that she wished you were in a different place. And you, yeah. in a way, are in the fact that you're able to really have a voice to impact people to make change more than maybe, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago. So that's that's a positive thing. And it doesn't have to, the thing is that it's been such slow baby steps that's one step forward and two steps back. And that's why this needed to happen is because it's yeah. been too slow for something that's too great of a crime that's continuing to happen. I have yeah. heard about some additional police reform programs that are being implemented and they're mostly having to do with community organizations that are indigenous to the actual uh, communities that they're coming from. And those communities are starting to create task forces from and out of the community, community leaders that are then starting to integrate with the police force in that particular area. So I have that some of the defunding is going towards new programs like that, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's going towards programs of, um, of social working and of, uh, of child development, which is absolutely needed. So we're getting the tides turned. And this is, this is happening, which is in neighborhoods around, around Los Angeles. This is happening here. I know that the nation is catching up and is got their own particular reforms. But what we've been, and you and I have been talking about over these last several shows, you mentioned the three, three C's. One was the cultural conversations, the courageousness, and also these uncomfortable conversations that we've been having. We've been creating this, and you're putting it in the form of art, which I'm really looking forward to, um, in forms, you said spinema, which you it's talked gonna about be, last time. It's, it's going to be intense. Well, that's the, the creator of it, um, uh, and, and he's a beautiful soul. I think that um, I would love for you he is the he he's the other side to NQ and they know each other. They're good friends. Um, Great. And he does cinema. He he has done uh, um, mainstream movies, uh, some very popular movies, and he also does spoken word. And he fuses them together and makes cinema. So he takes spoken word and cinema and fuses it together. So he has this beautiful prolific piece um, that comes from the from not the anger of a black man, but from the anguish of a black man. And it evokes your compassion. Um, and uh, he and I and uh, another colleague of ours, who's uh, uh, my white brother, 
um, we're going to do a piece and, and it's going to be disruptive because it's a, it's a colliding piece that finds its piece, but it's all the things said separately. We just say them to each other and then we find our piece. And so, um, I'm expressing that way. And then we're going to have these courageous, cultural courageous conversations. Um, and we're, and I've, I've scheduled the first one. And this one is a group of, um, a, a, a white men and women who are all over 45. And they're talking to a group of African-American men and women who are all under 30. And, um, <laughs> And, and, and here's the deal. In this conversation, we're not talking about culture because I, I think that we're missing the opportunity to have what I call cultural, prox, uh, in, uh, cultural proximity uh, intimacy by talking mm -hmm. about culture all the time. And so I'm going to facilitate this dialogue in a few weeks. And uh, I'm simply going to allow this 62-year-old white woman to see the heart and space of this 21-year-old black man, and vice versa. Mm. And mm. it's not like he's—it's not like he's on study for her to study him. It's that they're in, a, in an intimate exchange to see each other. And so uh, I'm going to start these virtually online, and I'm going to come back on your show when I have the first public date. This first one that I'm doing is private. Um, and um, then when I do it publicly, uh, we're going to come together and we're not talking about race. We're not talking about nationality. It's not to shame or blame our white brothers and sisters, nor is it for our black brothers and sisters to educate on what it means to be black. It's none of that. It is saying, can we decrease our proximity between each other so mm. that we can build a human race relationship that we haven't had the chance to do before. So it's like what you and I have done. The reason why we can sit here and there's anywhere we could go. That's why you don't need a script. I don't need a script. You never, because you trust me, I trust you because we've already had intimate cultural proximity. Yes, and yes, so yes. So my white brothers and sisters, when I extend the invitation for these conversations, you want to run to them because mm. I know how to facilitate a loving, nurturing, safe space yes. for us to trust ourselves and trust each other. You do. You absolutely do, which is why I can <laughs> thank you, which you I don't need you to make it comfortable for me. You just need to be able to open my safe awareness. Safe. And I need yeah. to make it safe. I don't have to make it comfortable because when you understand that this won't be easy, that there will be pain points along the way. But if you're willing, we can collectively create something that neither one of us, and when I say neither one of us, I mean neither one of our, our cultures could ever create separately. Like we are at a time, the reason why I'm so excited, mm. Lisa, mm. is because quite frankly, let me just say it this way, I'm excited because now you're pissed off. <laughs> I'm yes, excited yes. Because now yes, you're done. Yes. I'm excited. Yes. I'm excited because I feel like I have my cousins and my sisters in laws <laughs> and my stepsisters and my mothers in love and my I, I feel like I have all my extended family now. Now we can get something done. That's why I'm excited. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, and there's there's been a whole new awareness of this, what they call white centering, that the whiteness isn't the center of the culture of the universe, that there's a whole uh, cracked open Band-Aid ripping off moment where we don't have to have that conversation anymore. It doesn't no, have to no. start there anymore. There's it's nothing in, to protect. Uh, there's nothing to protect nothing to defend, nothing to hide. There's nothing like we get to coexist together and it doesn't take any of your abundance away. We get to coexist together and everything that's yours is still yours. And when you have that veil drop and you have that awareness rise, whoo, man. Yeah, I'm life, seeing it. Out of, yeah. Oh man, and I, I just gotta say this, out of responsibility to give our children that climate, that's what I'm excited about is that my grandchild gets to be born in this awareness. We yes. won't be there yet. Yes. We won't be there yet, but the awareness 
with our cousins and extended family, we will all be in it together in our unique ways. I am excited about what I'm seeing right now on mainstream media. There, rather than being a, there's a, a black film or a black TV show, we are, ha and one black reporter on every other network, we are, ha I am seeing a full on integration <laughs> and it's instant. Yeah. And I am on the casting side too. And I see that on the back end as well is I see what's coming through in the casting calls. And I'm so excited about what I'm seeing. I don't, I don't know if there's anyone else that has noticed, but that I am really excited. We are seeing full integration happening now. Shows getting canceled because they were too white. Shows that are getting canceled, that are being brought on now because they're rewriting the, the narrative. Yeah. So let me just say this, because this is the truth with it as well, that um, that while many of us who live inside the human race and its collectiveness, we see now an opportunity for it for people to be included and yes. key experience, like fairly yes. included. Yes. There is a population yes. of people. There's a population of people who will only see it as takeaway because they're fear driven, which is why whenever someone wants to dominate someone else and put their hand or their foot on your neck, it's because they're afraid of how high you will rise. Well, mm. the, and so I just wanna be, I, I wanna bring that true too. When, so there's gonna be this rise, as there's a rise of possibility, there's a rise of resistance and a rise of frustration, which is why all of a sudden after 50 years, you're seeing all these hate crimes coming out again. You're seeing all this, you know, uh -huh. and so it's important for us to constantly say, this isn't a black against white thing. And I've had to say that on my social media, when people were I've heard you saying me, that. Well, yes, many recently, times during the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. people were angry at me because I celebrated um, 4th of July, Independence Day. And I said, listen, I'm black. And so I'll celebrate Juneteenth. But I'm American. Like I, I, I get both. I, I'm not. I don't want to choose sides. If I choose sides, then I'm hmm. as I'm as much to blame as the other separatist. Like hmm. I, 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 that's not that's not going to get us there. And then I watched a movie um, that spotlighted Malcolm X and Martin Luther King this weekend, and really looked at how Martin was. Um, I'm sorry, Malcolm X early on was angry at Malcolm, uh, uh, Martin Luther King. Malcolm X was angry at Martin Luther King and called him an Uncle Tom because he wanted to do it in unity. And, you know, mm. we, still have, we still have that struggle where someone says, they, they, being white people, have done all of this to us. Why will we give them another chance? Why will we open up? So that's the conversation that's happening. The answer to that is because not everyone's thinking that way. Not everyone's operating that way. And there is a group of people who say the human race. Now, the deal is for those of you like you, Lisa, who are saying we need to operate as one, we need for you, Black America and, and people of color, actually, we need for you to do exactly what you're particularly doing, and that's read up. That's read up. Yeah. We want you to catch up. We're like, yes, we want you to run this race with us. I need you to warm up and catch up and get in the race with us. And so you can't really start with a trot, right? Because a, a trot and a slow walk got us to George Floyd, right? We need right. you. I need right. you to intensively train. I need you to intensively go in. I need you to make your reading three nights a week. Don't get overly consumed with it where you burn out because I need you for the longevity. I need you for the long haul. So don't give six hours a, a, a day to it or, or 10 hours a week to it. Maybe give it three hours of study a week, but, but get studied and then let's do this together. And so I, I know that I get hit because I stand for unity, but I'm very clear. I said 20 years ago, I don't just belong to Black America. I don't just belong mm. to Christians and I don't just belong to women. I belong to humanity. I've said that mm. since I started this journey. Mm. 
You do. You stand for unity. You always have. You've always been such an incredibly inclusive conversation because the conversation ultimately ends in love. I remember that Marianne Williamson was criticized for saying that they were she was going to fight Trump with love and love would win. Well, look, it is it it really ultimately does win and it has to happen though within the hearts of the people. It's a it's a more intimate movement than a massive political movement. Love is an intimate movement and that happens when you and I speak. It happens when people listen to this and watch this show. It happens in the moments where they're interacting with other black and white brothers and sisters. That's where it happens. And so thank you for being a stand for unity. Thank you for all of the incredible inspiration that you have given us to continue all of our research, all of our, our information and bringing it together. And I will bring about the information as well about Measure R and how other people can get involved in the three strikes law and to eradicate that. There is so much more that we have to do. As I said at the beginning of the show, it's not one day, it's every day. And yeah. I thank you, my sister, Lisa, thank you so much for everything you. you're doing for the cultural, for the intimate yeah. cultural proximity and for having this culturally courageous conversation as you've been talking about. We, Thank and, you. Ms. And I will continue to design them. And then we'll also have ways in which we can reach across the color lines and hold each other. So we'll be coming out with a lot of that and um, just keep your eyes out. When we can get together again too, please. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. Yes, please. All right. I love, I you, love and you. And I love what you stand for. I love your willingness to um, uh, take this conversation straight, straight between the eyes. I, I love the ownership. I love the willingness oh, to go, how, how am I part of the solution now? I didn't know what I didn't know, but now I know what I know. And what should I be doing with what I know? That's all you have to yeah. ask. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know, but now that I know what I didn't know, what yeah. should I be doing with what I know? Right. I love the yes. question and I love the commitment. I'm your sister. Uh, in the journey always. Uh, there's a reason why we're on the planet at the same time. There's a reason why we're the Lisa and Lisa. <laughs> Lisa and Lisa team, I am so grateful for you, my love. All right, yeah. in love and I in love awareness. You. Until next time, I invite everyone to stay aware. Thank you.